Hi, welcome to True Creeps, where the stories are true and the creeps are real. We'll cover stories from grotesque gore to the possibly plausible paranormal, to horrifying history, to tense and terrible true crime, and everything else that goes bump in the night. We're your hosts, Amanda, and I'm Lindsay, and we want you to join us while we creep. We cover mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hello, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about a little weird history about a very deadly contest that happened in the Philippines. But also, this is another short. It is another short. We're kind of excited about this format, in case you haven't noticed already. This will not be the first. Maybe it's the second. Maybe it's the third. Who could say where this will fall? We don't know. <laughs> but I like the idea that we can just do a moment. You know, we don't have to do like a 17,000 year episode. Yeah, this has been a fun time. And a lot of these are things that we wanted to talk about, but they weren't quite a whole episode. It's been nice. So this one, uh, well, first off, Lindsay, are you a Pepsi person or a Coke person? Okay, I've got bad news for you. I was picking up a glass of water <laughs> as I said that, so you probably heard the ice. Something that I learned is that my body does not handle aspartame. And I was, as a woman of beverages, very thoroughly a woman of Diet Coke. <laughs> faithful to my diet coke knowing that it was absolute garbage for my body just like on a on a normal person standard and then i accidentally didn't drink it for like two weeks because we just didn't have any and we had seltzer and i was drinking that and then i drank something with aspartame and i felt like i well first off it felt like somebody had hit me in the back of the head with a shovel Ugh. and then i felt like have you ever hurt yourself and then you're on like painkillers for like a legitimate reason. I'm not saying that you're otherwise taking <laughs> painkillers. I'm just saying like my experience with this was like legitimate. I literally felt as though I was like on like some type of insane painkiller. Like I was loopy. I couldn't focus on anything. It was wild. And now anytime I consume aspartame, that is the way that it is. The other day, Ben and I were driving and he literally, he put his can in the place where my can normally is. I took a sip of his <laughs> Diet Coke. I had him pull off the highway. Oh my gosh. So I could spit it out and gargle because I would not swallow it because I was like, that's how <laughs> fucked up this makes me. Like not even a single sip. Anyway, that's not the reason for the season. You asked a simple question and it was, is it Coke or Pepsi? And the answer is seltzer because I'm a prissy little <laughs> body bitch. But if I'm going to drink a soda, I would probably like a Fanta orange because sun-kissed orange is swill for uncultured swine. And you cannot convince me otherwise. Fanta is the appropriate and the best orange soda. A lot of feelings. I do. I, I mean it. A woman of beverages, though. What was I thinking? A woman of beverages. You would expect no less from me. <laughs> well, there's a reason I asked that. And because the contest we're going to talk about realistically came up because there was a feud between Pepsi and Coke and Pepsi wanting to make more money and sell more product in areas where Coke was doing much better. It was wild. So in... <laughs> 1992, a Pepsi contest in the Philippines ended with many people losing their lives. Ugh. And that's wild to me that like a contest could cause someone to die, right? Yeah. The contest was called Number Fever, and the winner would become a millionaire receiving one million in pesos. Okay. So this was a pretty big deal because it was like the largest prize. It was at the time 611 times the country's average monthly salary at one time. I would also say today, one million in pesos is fifty thousand dollars too. For perspective, if you're in the U.S., isn't that interesting? Yeah, because around that time, one million in pesos was equivalent to about forty thousand. I want to say. Unfortunately, the Philippines had you know a really bad struggling economy, and there was widespread poverty. So, like again, this was just a big deal. So the odds of winning were twenty eight point eight million to one, and every night the TV station would reveal that day's winning number. And I believe that there was like smaller daily prizes that could be won, but the main prize was like what everyone was after, obviously. Mm -hmm. How you'd win is like when you'd buy a Pepsi, you know, the bottle cap, it would have a number underneath. So two bottle caps in the entire country should have contained the grand prize winning number. So again, everyone's playing, ads are everywhere, 29 radio stations and four newspapers were circulating the winning numbers. So like everywhere you looked, right? They're like, this is the number today. This is the number. So everyone's talking about it. 
And then because of that, it was so popular that it was supposed to end on May 8th, but they extended it five additional weeks because they're like, oh my gosh, this is working. People are buying our product. Let's keep it going. So I've seen a few varying reports, but it's estimated that 50 to 70 percent of the population took part in this contest. For the period of time that it ran, all you had to do was buy at least one drink that was from this company. So it's not as though yeah, it's a hard contest to enter. And you may have entered and not even meant to and then been like, well, I'll just keep my cap just in case. Exactly. Exactly. And like when I was reading about it, I don't know what you're thinking, but like it made me think of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. You know the scene where they're all buying chocolate and going nuts for it? I feel like that's how it was, but with Pepsi. Because they were like, we're buying Pepsi every day. We're buying our kids Pepsis. Like, we're going to the grocery store multiple times a day to grab a Pepsi because we want that cap. So you were thinking of the purchasing aspect of it. I'm thinking of the hoarding aspect of it where you have, like, a wall of bottle caps. In my head, I was like, how would I store these bottle caps? And by the way, I've already figured that out. I'd have a trifold poster board. I would hot glue each one. Oh, wow. Onto the trifold board. Okay. And I would have them in relative number order. Anyway, I don't know. <laughs> that was important for my brain. But have you played any like of these contests like this? So what it made me think of immediately wasn't Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It was McDonald's Monopoly game, which oh yeah, I don't do well with any of those. Like I'm like hoarding fucking like <laughs> little pieces. Did you know that you could buy those little fucking Monopoly squares on like eBay? Like you can like yeah work some shit out. Like now it's all digital. Starbucks has their little like shake your phone for like a snow globe and maybe it'll win something. And like it gives you like a polar bear ornament. And if you get three, then you get Starbucks <laughs> for a month. I don't give a shit. I'm shaking my phone, living my life. Love those things. But it made me think of when McDonald's would do that, I would perpetually have McDonald's pieces in my car because I would put them someplace safe. And then like the next year, I'd be like, what the shit is this? Why are these here? Like little pieces. There's probably <laughs> still like pieces up under my seats. Okay, so the person who created the contest was named Pedro Vergara, and he worked for the promotions department in New York. After a successful U.S. rollout, Pepsi CEO Christopher Sinclair wanted to fight Coca-Cola abroad, and they made this a part of that strategy. And so Sinclair actually had a reputation of being a, quote, battlefield commander uh, <laughs> and had visited 77 countries in six months. That's wild. I'm exhausted at the mere thought of that. No, that's way too many countries. I'm still tired from like this summer. Like, yeah, I'm like, oh, I traveled three <laughs> times this year. She's exhausted. No. Yeah. So during his visit, Sinclair found the world's grocery stores were, quote, awash with Coca-Cola red. Pepsi hired a Mexican company, DG Consultores, to bring the contest to Argentina, Chile, Guatemala, Mexico, and the Philippines. And the contest led to monthly sales jumping from 10 million to 14 million. So it worked. And their market share jumped from 19.4 to 24.9. Bottling plants were producing for 20 hours per day, which sounds like a lot because it is, because it was literally double how they had been working before. And so as the contest started, it got pretty scary pretty fast. People started being arrested because they were stealing one another's bottle caps. And even some people who worked in the grocery stores were being killed over the bottle caps too. And we saw at least two different articles where they mentioned that this had happened, but we didn't see who, like the names of the people who had actually died. Otherwise, we would include them as we do. In uh, earlier that year in Chile, a garbled fax led to a wrong number being announced as the winner, which triggered riots. People in the Philippines were creating winning bottle cops, which was leading people to try to claim the prize and being wrongly denied before the biggest error happened soon after. Yikes. Let's move forward then to the day that all kinds of bad things happened. So it was May 25th when the actual incident happened. The grand prize winner was called and the winning number was number 349. And remember, there was only supposed to be two all over the Philippines. People were finding out that they won with their 349 bottle cap. And I've seen so many stories of like the winners. One person had three with the same number. One woman who was a mother of 12 had 35 winning bottle caps. Total. There was hundreds of thousands who thought that they had won. Winners started to make their way to Pepsi's bottling factory in Quezon City, which was northeast of Manila, to claim their winnings. As the crowds began to gather, Rosemary Vera, a marketing director, was called. She was told by a secretary that there were many 
349 caps in circulation. So they're like, uh, understatement. Oh, no. <laughs> At around 10 p.m., someone from Pepsi called the Philippine Department of Trade and Industry and said a mistake had been made. Also, sometime during the night, I couldn't find a time, the crowds that were gathered were told that there was an error and no prize money would be given out. Pepsi claimed that only two winning bottle caps had a special security code, and then people were understandably upset, saying none of the promotional material said anything about the special code. So, of course, their anger started to grow. And when you think about all the different types of contests now, they all have that really tiny, fine print. And I'm sure this is one of the many reasons, right? Mm -hmm. So the crowd outside of the case and factory started throwing rocks. Police and soldiers were called in. During all this chaos, one report said that executives inside the factory were trying to get a hold of executives in New York, but Sinclair was on a yacht at an annual gathering of bottlers. An extra bad look. But then at around 3 a.m. that night, Pepsi executives held a meeting and realized that something was off, so they started strategizing for their next steps. Protests happened throughout the night. Understandably so, right? Like you've been buying lots and lots of this product so that you could possibly win. You think you have because of their error. Like you'd be mad. One of the witnesses as to what was going on outside the factory was Vincente Del Fierro Jr. He was an advising consultant and a preacher for a Catholic sect. Interestingly, he wrote an open letter to a newspaper saying that the promotion was, quote, a social disease that nurtures the gambling instinct in our children. But he was there because his daughter had a winning cap. He later wrote about how he saw security guards throwing glass soda bottles at the crowd and then a policeman with a riot shield had charged at him. Can you imagine the chaos outside that building? He took safety at a nearby Dunkin' Donuts with some other people who were also there to claim their winnings. And he asked for volunteers to get a list of winners' names. And as reporters gathered around, he announced, it's about third world countries being exploited by multinationals. This was the start of something that would later be called Coalition 349. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few. So in the building, a manager tried to escape the factory, but was also met with those protesters that were throwing rocks. So they couldn't get out safely. It also sucks that they're going to like the bottling plant. The people who are doing that have literally nothing to do with this. They're just doing their jobs. They're not like the person who sent the facts, read the facts, made the promotion or anything. Exactly. Yeah. So there's even bomb threats that took place. And at one point, Pepsi tried to change the winning number and newspapers reported it the next morning that the real winning number was 134. But then that just added to all the confusion. When Lindsay mentioned that Pepsi had like a late night meeting, during that late night meeting, Pepsi decided that it would pay the winning number holders who came forward in the next two weeks a quote-unquote goodwill gesture of 500 pesos. Oh my gosh, less than 1% of the actual prize. A lot of people just took the offer. They're like, I don't have time for this. Took the offer. In the first two days, though, Pepsi paid out more than 12.5 million in pesos, which is crazy. So let's talk about how the error actually occurred. 349 was a designated non-winner number in the original promotion, and it was accidentally chosen as the winner during the contest extension because of a computer glitch. Oh. So if they had ended when they were supposed to, it wouldn't have, like, from what I understand, confused the computer, and it would have grabbed one of the other numbers, but extending the contest... I think, confused it. So I've seen reports anywhere from 600 to 800,000 had winning caps. So people of those numbers, some people could have thrown away their bottle caps. Not that many people came forward, but a large amount of them did. If they had honored all 800,000 winners, it would have cost Pepsi $32 billion. Insane. Yeah. So Pepsi tried to say that the caps from the extension had been printed with a different seven-digit security code and that none of those would be honored. It looked like it just looked like a weird number, like under the main number. Mm -hmm. So people, obviously, and not surprisingly, did not like that response of, oh, well, those don't count. And they continued to protest. So this gave Del Fierro a lot of support with what I had mentioned before, Coalition 349. And he also got a boost from Coca-Cola's local CEO. Interesting. And apparently he gave Del Fierro 10,000 pesos as startup money. And reporters have tried to reach out to Coca-Cola about this and they never confirm it. This particular CEO who had done this, allegedly, died in 2013. Now, what Coalition 349 did was it organized rallies outside of Pepsi plants, and they also prepared a lawsuit. 
So Del Fiero hoped that they would be able to be certified as a class action and that they would be able to get basically a massive settlement for the bottle cap owners who had come forward. Mm -hmm. He accepted 500 pesos for legal fees from people who could afford it and worked pro bono for those who were unable to come up with the money, which, by the way, is interesting because like a lot of law firms, what they'll do for something like this is that you won't necessarily have to pay a retainer up front you'll have to basically just say like they'll get a contingency fee like they'll like if you win yeah they'll get up to a certain percentage but so meanwhile kenneth ross pepsi's international spokesperson would not want to be the him at this moment in time by the way no portrayed any activist around this event as an opportunist and said quick buck artists have lured thousands of unwitting filipinos with very empty promises of a huge settlement for the payment of an upfront fee and from what we saw, there were a few other groups with similar names like United 349, Solid 349, and they were charging fees for membership. Some even agreed to pay 30% of future settlements for some of the groups, that contingency fee. Mm -hmm. And people were doing what they could to come up with money like selling their livestock. So like, I understand why they're saying like, if you have to put up money up front like that, to me, that's like, a, hmm, that's a little weird. If you're doing the research and like trying to do all the organizing up front is that wrong right so while people were organizing protesters in Quezon city were still going and now it's like gotten even worse they were like burning things and then between 32 to 37 delivery trucks were overturned burned stoned or vandalized by the protesters some people were even offering cash for a 349 cap in hopes that they'd be able to get a bigger settlement or pay off later so, like, it's just, again, people are walking up. Oh, you have one? I'll buy it from you. Yeah. Uh, and then, you know, some people that are desperate are like, I guess, right? Like, I might not get anything for it here, but you might be able to. When money now is money now. Exactly. So there's also Molotov cocktails that were being thrown into the Pepsi factories and sometimes into the delivery trucks. Executives for Pepsi were having to travel with bodyguards. One woman, Pacencia Salem, who was a 64-year-old protester in Manila, said, quote, even if I die here, my ghost will come to fight Pepsi. Oh my God, a Pepsi ghost. Yep, that caught my attention when we were researching. When we had that discussion of like, what would our ghost do? Hers would still get vengeance on Pepsi. Oh, I love a protest ghost. Didn't even think about that. Love that. Yeah. Mm -mm. And here's what's sad. Her husband had unfortunately died of heart failure Ugh. during a march. But she seemed like under no circumstance was she stopping. So within months, around 10,000 claimants filed suits demanding money. In January of 1993, Pepsi had to pay a fine of 150,000 pesos to the Department of Trade and Industry for deviating from the promotional campaign that the government had approved. And Kenneth Ross, who we mentioned earlier, told the Los Angeles Times, quote, We have done everything that we think is reasonable to amicably conclude this issue. At this point, we do not intend to lay out additional money. So people are still fighting for it. He's saying, mm, we don't plan on doing anything else. Del Fiero, around the same time, had hired five employees to process new lawsuit claimants. He eventually ended up signing around 800. He also was looking for U.S. lawyers to bring the fight to New York. And so by February, the chaos was still going on, and especially around Pepsi trucks in the buildings still. One morning, Anitecha Rosario, who was a school teacher, went to the store to buy rice. And when she got there, there was a Pepsi truck that was also arriving. Someone threw a homemade bomb that bounced off the truck and then it detonated. Anicheta was killed along with a five-year-old girl. And then five other people were injured in this attack. It's so sad. During Anicheta's funeral, her lower half had to be covered because her legs were just completely shattered. Her husband, Raul Rosario, was later invited to a meeting with Pepsi. They offered him 50,000 pesos in exchange for an agreement not to sue. And he told them, it's because of the 349 incident, because you cheated people. And he stormed out. But not long afterwards, he changed his mind and did accept the money. His friend had advised him to do so, and he never remarried. And he didn't speak for days after she died. That's so devastating. Yeah, I didn't know this ever happened. I hadn't heard of it either. I saw a little post and I was like, what happened? And then I went down this rabbit hole and I was like, oh my gosh, like because of a contest, how many people's lives were changed because of a stupid soda, right? I'm surprised Pepsi survived. Yeah, right? I, I had never known. And like... I know we talked about soda earlier. My family growing up, they were a Pepsi family. Like my mom always had a Pepsi in hand all the time. And now I'm like, ugh, it was like during this that she had a Pepsi in hand. 
So there continued to be violence occurring in the attempts to get Pepsi to pay. And at one point, the NBI, the National Bureau of Investigation, was investigating some of the violence and dubbed the three kings behind the anti-Pepsi bombings. And one of the men in the group, Rodelio Formento, had claimed that a Pepsi security officer was at one of the meetings and that the company had paid the three kings to cause violence at the rallies in an effort to frame protest organizers. Oh. Also, he said that he had been hired to cause a rift among the various movement's leaders. He said that he had felt guilty and he decided to tell the truth. Unfortunately, though, when people were like, did this really happen? Like, is this just a rumor? They were trying to locate him and they weren't able to. So then in February of 1994, Pepsi finally lost a 349 case against a 21-year-old medical student named Joelle Roque. Roke won a lower court verdict in Bulacan, north of Manila, ordering Pepsi to pay him more than 1 million pesos. However, the company appealed, and I could not find if a payout ever occurred. So Del Fierro continued his fight, but ultimately he never won a settlement from Pepsi. During his fight, he suffered a stroke, and afterwards, the Philippine Supreme Court issued arrest warrants for nine local Pepsi executives. There's a photograph of Del Fierro holding a newspaper with a headline about it, but there's no record that the warrants were ever executed. He soon suffered another stroke that almost killed him, but he also made a vow that he would keep fighting even after he was gone, which, heartbreaking. Yeah. I can't imagine how life-changing it would have been to be one of those people outside of that plant because it wasn't as though they were like, you're going to win a new pair of shoes or something minuscule. It was life-changing amounts of money. You elicit a different type of response from people when it's life changing. Yeah. Generational wealth building kind of like money to me. Your whole world's different if you had that money. And so you go there with that hope and then that desperation that you would have. Yeah, that and it's a reputable company, right? Like it's not like the grocery store down the street is doing a little contest and then they don't pay out. It is a worldwide known company. Yeah. Del Fierro died in 2010 after having yet another stroke. And even though he never won a settlement, he can claim some credit for the pressure that he applied that kind of made the government strengthen its provisions for misleading and deceptive advertisements. And it started to monitor promotional schemes and then doubled their fines against companies that would violate consumer rights. His daughter, Seinbull, built a Coalition 349 website and continued his fight for a while after his death. It used to be Pepsi349.com, but it looks like it may have been taken over by ads, though. And then in 2010, someone posted on Pepsi's Facebook that had the last name Del Fierro. And then protests slowly died out. Yeah. And in 2006, a Philippine court finally ruled that Pepsi hadn't been negligent and they weren't liable for damages. However, in total, by the end of 1994, 689 civil suits and 5,200 criminal complaints had been thrown out of court. So it's just like how many people were fighting for this is like, just crazy to think about. Yeah. This contest became a case study in a risk management textbook. It's also used as a cautionary tale when people do contests. And it's created the slang term. I'm sure it was more popular back then, but it was to be 349 and it meant to be duped. We also saw some accounts when we were researching that local businesses to this day refuse to carry Pepsi there. I mean, that's very fair. And then this one, just kind of on topic, but off topic, I guess Pepsi years ago also had another promotion where they kind of didn't hold up their end of the bargain again, but it's kind of a silly reason. So I saw that there's a story about a jet being purchased with Pepsi points in a commercial in 1996. And so someone saw that commercial and was able to get enough points. And then he was like, I want my jet. And they're like, that was a joke. Yeah. And he, like, took them to court over it, but he did not ever get his jet. But assholes. Assholes. I've never heard anything that's this drastic of a fuck up. These contests that companies hold in order to make money just sometimes prove even more that, like, these companies don't care about humans, generally. I'm not saying that they want them to die, but that their purpose is to make money. They're not to make the world a better place. Yeah, yeah, it's just, it's unfortunate that lives were lost because of it. So if you've heard of any other contests that have caused any sort of destruction like this, let us know. I'm so curious to read about more of them. Yeah, yeah. 
thanks for joining us for this short. Yeah. Happy spooky season. Yeah. And we'll see you with our next one. Thanks for creeping with us. Oh, sheet, our editing software lets us have this random robot voice. Stay tuned for bloopers and extra tangents. Thanks for listening. And as always, a special thank you to our patrons who support us via Patreon. Please see the link in our show notes to learn more about how you, yes, you, can begin to haunt the dump, guard vortexes, or even become a scorching Sasquatch. Ooh. Also in our show notes, you can find the link to our website, more information on our sources, our social media handles, and our merch store. We'd love for you to keep creeping with us. So if you like this episode, please subscribe, rate, review, and share the show with your fellow creeps and or ghosts. I beg of you. (laughs) Don't mind me dragging you back into this conversation. Are you a Pepsi or Coke woman? So I don't drink a lot of soda, but if I had to pick a soda, I like vanilla Coke. She's making faces at me. I normally have water at all times. I feel like I should have taken a screenshot of that face that I made. It was like, honestly, it, I was a lipless slit with beady eyes. <laughs> like, that's what I was just now. But <laughs> why? I don't like vanilla in things. I love vanilla. Uh, oh, my gosh. They made a vanilla orange Coke. And I hate like we know, we don't ever like keep soda at the house unless we're having like people over because we're like, we are normal people that enjoy things that other people like. But all we all we ever have is water and coffee. Well, first off, I mean, like, look, the necessities, it's very important. When I was a woman of Diet Coke, I love they had like a spicy one that was good that I liked. OK, you're making faces at vanilla and you're like, I like spicy Coke. Like what? Yeah. And it was like a spicy cherry, though. I like that one a lot. It, it was like, do you want to do you want to eat some Tums casually? You're in your 30s. This is a part of who you are now. No, thank you. You know what? Also, I will fuck with a Fresca now and then. <laughs> you know, don't you like? <laughs> Look, it's it's good. It's it's a random thing, but like a Fresca now and then isn't a bad thing. Sure. Uh, I will say too because we're gonna be. Ooh, I hit the mic. I will say too because we're going to be talking about Pepsi quite a bit. They recently had something called Nitro Pepsi, and it was cola meets coffee. It was like their thing, and it was the worst thing I've ever tried. It was so bad. That sounds disgusting. Do you also, just like as a quick thing, do you know what cola is a combination of? Tell us. It's like cinnamon and caramel is like the flavor combination of what it is. It's like cinnamon caramel soda. Interesting. I could be completely wrong with that. (laughs) She's just making shit up today. This isn't related to what we're talking about at all, but we're on Discord with one another looking at each other. The mushrooms behind me are breathing. Yeah, they're moving. That's why I was like, okay. I am so wildly uncomfortable with it. I'm going to make sure that like myself and I only look at you because I don't like that. It makes me nervous. I don't know why. I preferred the weird ice people before. Oh, were they moving too? Uh Uh-huh. Well, I mean, what baby wants, baby gets. (laughs) (laughs) Also, we have to mention that we're both wearing (laughs) the same shirt today. (laughs) Ah, yeah. And it's our everlasting faint. Ah, just the best. Also, Amanda, you're going to When We Were Young, the weekend of when this comes out. Will you be wearing an everlasting faint shirt? Because it sounds like a band. (laughs) I should, huh? I was actually thinking because, all right, so anyone going, I'm so excited. Uh, I, what? When does this come out? This comes out next weekend. Oh, yeah, I'm going this weekend. Oh, man. But I, I've also seen a lot of people because we're technically, I think we're geriatric emos is what we're called. Don't say that to me. I know. It's offensive. It's very offensive. But I've also, I really want this shirt that says, because I was like a, a wannabe scene kid. I don't think I was ever cool enough to be a scene kid, but like. Yeah, same, same. I, th- I, I wish that I was and I tried so hard. It didn't work. But I want to get a shirt that says seen, seen your citizen. Shut up. Like spelled seen. Literally shut your mouth. Literally shut your mouth. (laughs) I was thinking about getting it to wear to the show. We'll see. Oh my gosh. Is that a thing that many people make or one person makes? I've seen a couple people saying like, what, what, where do you fall? And they're like geriatric emo, elder emo, emo. E- like baby emo senior citizen <laughs> and i was like i think i'm a senior citizen i'm trying to like i typed it in and the internet just thinks oh no it, I, I typed it in right they just think you're you can't spell <laughs> as a person 
oh well first it's so- first off it's sold out on etsy for this like basic ass shirt yeah etsy's like fuck you you cannot spell no i did not mean senior citizen etsy or google <laughs> That's fascinating. I've heard like elder millennials, but like, yeah, I don't know. I also love that emo's like coming back. I don't like that people are being like, you're not real emo if you don't. Know. I'm like, oh, get over yourself. Like, literally, just get over yourself. You like the music? Great. Oh, yeah. You want to dress a certain way? Great. I don't care. Mm-hmm. I don't have the energy. You know what? Do you have the energy to talk about? Uh, by the way, speaking of McDonald's, off topic, did you see the adult Happy Meals? I did. I did see the adult Happy Meals. I didn't. Do I come off as pretentious this time around? I am eating seltzer. But like, I realized that when I eat fast food, my bones feel real rickety. So I stopped eating it. Well, fast food's not food. <laughs> it doesn't mold. So that's how you know it. Realistically. Yeah. But did I want the, did I want that toy? Yeah. Fuck yeah, I did. Here's the problem. I only wanted Grimace. I got Grimace. I wanted the stupid fucking four-eyed toy. Ben got like the little man that's not Grimace. I don't know who he is. It's like a smiley face. The one with the hat? Yeah, Oliver got that one. Well, I had to and I was very excited to get Grimace because listeners don't know, but Lindsay knows my husband has a weird phobia with Grimace and I was so excited to get Grimace. I mean, like, can I just tell you, knowing that he has a fear of Grimace, I only want to send Grimace things to you. Like, do I want to find just a Grimace (laughs) costume for Ollie to just appear in one day? I absolutely do. (laughs) But I don't want Mike to like accidentally hurt your child because he thinks it's a real Grimace coming for him. You know, like, that's my favorite thing because everyone feels that same way once they hear that he's afraid of Grimace. Yeah, oh, I immediately want to fuck with him. For Christmas, every year for his birthday, anytime anyone sees any sort of Grimace item anywhere, I get a text. Hey, should I get this for Mike? <laughs> like, here's the thing. Maybe not for Mike, but for you. And I'm like, absolutely, you should. Because this way it's like, Amanda, we know you love Grimace. <laughs> yeah. Someone gave us a uh, Grimace pop figure. Love that. And when they came over to make it very difficult for Mike to hide and put away, they put it on top of the cabinets in the kitchen. So it's very high up and like we'd have to go get a ladder to get it down. And it's been there for like a year now, just like staring at him. I love that. Again, here I am fucking moving around in my squeak chair. 